Welcome everyone. I am Erica Piola, Director of the Visual Culture Program, and I'm delighted to be the host of this afternoon's talk with Dr. Jennifer Chong. Jennifer is presenting today as the culminating speaker in our year of programming to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the publication of Phyllis Wheatley's formative work, Poems and Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. For this talk, as informed by her recent article, Engraving's Immovable Veil, Phyllis Wheatley's Portrait and the Politics of Technique in the June 2022 edition of the Art Bulletin, Jennifer will explore the authorship of Wheatley through the engraved frontispiece portrait of herself included in poems and various subjects. But before we begin, I would like to note that there will be time for questions and answers after the talk, so please place any queries in the Q&A button that you see in the bottom of the screen. I would also like to briefly introduce the library company and the visual culture program to those who may not be familiar with either. Today, a research library, the library company was originally started in 1731 as a subscription library by then printer Benjamin Franklin and his discussion group, the Junto. Today, we are an independent research library for the study of American culture and history before the early 20th century. Our rich holdings include over 1 million books, graphics, ephemera, and art and artifacts, and, and comprise subject strengths such as African-American history, women's history, and visual culture. The latter inspired the implementation of the Visual Culture Program with a mission to promote visual literacy through the creative use of historical visual materials and supports exhibitions, research fellowships, publications, acquisitions, digital projects, and public programs. Relatedly, I wanted to quickly mention that the applications for the 2024-2025 William H. Helfand Fellowship in American Visual Culture are now being accepted until the deadline of January 15th, 2024. I hope some of you in the audience will consider applying. Please see the chat for the link to the application page. With that said, the Visual Culture Program seeks to facilitate talks such as today's that confront, explore, and complicate the social construction of what we see, how we see, and why we see it as we do in our understanding of the mass visual culture of the nation before 1950. Often a component of the social construction of the visual world of an era is the interplay between text and image. Today, Jennifer examines the only known to be extant portrait of Wheatley as an attestation to the material existence of an enslaved person who by virtue of her intelligence, erudition, and imagination shattered slavery's foundational claim that enslaved persons were objects. Jennifer will explore both the ways in which the portrait supports these aims and the ways in which it undercuts them. Understanding its double representation provides a key to understanding Wheatley's vexed reception from her time to ours. Now it is with great pleasure I introduce Jennifer Chong, who is an art historian whose research centers on the art, architecture, and material culture of the transatlantic world in the 18th and 19th centuries, as it relates to histories of environment and race. She holds a PhD and MA in the history of art and architecture from Harvard University, and an MS in the history, theory, and criticism of architecture and art from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In her work, Jennifer prioritizes the intelligence of makers and making in order to expand our understanding of what art is, who makes it, and who makes it. In addition to the frontispiece portrait of Phyllis Wheatley, recent publications have focused on the tacit contributions of revolutionary printers, the nature of early American veneer furniture, the appeal and meaning of gloss in 19th century America, as well as the surfaces of Alex Katz's artworks. Thank you so much again for joining us this afternoon, Jennifer, and the screen is now yours. Thank you, Erica. It's really wonderful to be here, and I'm delighted to be part of this series celebrating the 250th anniversary of Phyllis Wheatley's poems on various subjects, religious and moral. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Massachusetts people, um, and that much of the work of this project was done on these lands. Um, I think an especially um, relevant thing to think about in the context of um, our topic today. Um, my aim today is to open up a conversation about the portrait of Wheatley that was included as a frontispiece to her book. It's a notable work for many reasons, um, including the fact that it is the first portrait of an African-American woman and a very rare example of a named portrait of an enslaved subject. As the title of my talk suggests, it's a complex representation 
and I want to hold true to that complexity. I'm going to begin by talking about the remarkable fact of the portrait and the remarkable nature of its representation before delving into the way in which its line engraved technique cuts against its positive representation by participating in 18th century racist ideas about the so-called monotony of black skin. I wanna emphasize that my aim here is not to detract from the singular portrait, which is justly celebrated. At the same time, I think that acknowledging the complexity of the portrait helps us better understand the deeply oppressive circumstances in which Wheatley lived and worked and against which she prevailed. It also helps us better understand, as Erica mentioned, the deeply polarized reception of Wheatley's writing and the full work we need to do as a society to grapple with the broad, deep roots of racism as they continue to shape our world today. In closing then, I'll suggest one way in which we can push back against the unjust claims of this portrait by respecting the surfaces it represents. And I look forward to perhaps exploring other possibilities in the Q&A that follows. Before we dive into the what and how of Wheatley's portrait, it's important to acknowledge the extraordinary fact of its mere existence. In the 18th century British transatlantic world, it was rare in any case for black subjects and especially black enslaved subjects to sit for individualized portraits. It was also independently rare for 18th century books to feature frontispiece portraits of authors, even white authors, and especially during the author's lifetime. And that's because the inclusion of a portrait increased the cost of, of the book. Because of this fact, Wheatley is both the, both the first person of African descent to have her poetry published in the British public sphere. And she's also the first colonial American woman of any race to have her portrait printed alongside her writings. The fact that the portrait was made speaks to the unusual circumstances of Wheatley's enslavement and the specific ambitions of her book. The person that we know, now know as Phyllis Wheatley or Phyllis Wheatley Peters was born in the Senegambia region of Africa and stolen from her home when she was about seven or eight years old. She was transported to Boston on a ship named Phyllis, where she was purchased by John Wheatley to serve as a companion to his wife, Susanna. In that capacity, Wheatley learned crucially to read and to write, and she was given an excellent wide ranging education. This was an exceptional act on her enslaver's part, but it would not have become as well known in the annals of American history had Wheatley not proven to be an exceptional student. In 1766, five years after arriving in Boston with, we believe, no knowledge of English, Wheatley was able to write a letter to the Mohegan minister Sansom Samson Ockham, as well as compose a four-line elegy on a neighbor's death. Following the 1770 publication of another elegy, this time for the renowned evangelist George Whitfield, Wheatley herself became a transatlantic celebrity, paving the way for the publication of her book of a book of her poetry. Despite Wheatley's growing renown, the path to publication was not smooth. In 1772, Wheatley and her enslavers launched a campaign to publish her collected poems in Boston, but they were not able to obtain the 300 subscribers demanded by the publisher. Not long daunted and perhaps even pleased by the prospect of a more prestigious publication venue, the Wheatleys began looking for a London publisher. Crucially, the new proposal would include the promise of a dedication by permission to Selina Hastings, the Countess of Huntington and an active abolitionist. Having been intrigued by a copy of Whitfield's elegy, which um, Phyllis Wheatley sent to her in 1770, and then encouraged by positive accounts from her acquaintances, the Countess had agreed to patronize the work with one request. As the Wheatley's intermediary, a Captain John Califf, wrote to them in January 17, 1773, quote, one thing um, the Countess desired, which she said she hardly thought would be denied her, that was to have Phyllis's picture in the frontispiece, so that if you would get it done, it can be engraved here. I do imagine it can be easily done and think would contribute greatly to the sale of the book, end quote. So on the one hand, Hastings uh, request motivated the creation of a portrait whose very existence, as Betsy Urkula puts it, quote, exploded a social order grounded in notions of racial difference, end quote. On the other hand, it must be acknowledged that Wheatley's frontispiece was conceived of as having a different function than most author portraits. If frontispiece portraits were generally markers of status, 
Wheatley's frontispiece, a portrait of a young black enslaved woman who had never before published a book, functioned somewhat differently. Um, it was rather than a, a statement of status, um, a testimonial, um, a testimonial like the dedication and the famous attestation um, that were also included with the book. And as a testimonial, it was meant to assure readers that Wheatley had in fact authored the poems in her book. So at this point, I'd like to turn to the frontispiece and I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So to consider the kind of testimonial provided by the portrait, um, I wanna turn now to what it represents. Um, in this picture, we see a young woman seated at an oval desk. She is neatly, if plainly dressed, and she holds herself with a relaxed dignity, the gentle curve of her back reiterated by the serpentine style of her chair. With her right hand, she touches a quill pen to paper on which a few lines of writing can be seen, and her left hand lends gentle support to her head. An extended finger draws attention to her face, especially her calm gaze, directed upward in contemplation of her next words. Right away, we can notice that Wheatley is the sole subject of this portrait and that she is depicted with an upright posture that speaks to her well-mannered comportment. As I mentioned earlier, in the early modern period, it was rare for black servants or enslaved subjects to be represented alone. Instead, they generally appear with white subjects in positions of subservience. Alternatively, as Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw has noted, when enslaved African women were represented alone in the eight, late 18th century, they were generally presented as objects of sexual desire or painful humiliation. In contrast, Wheatley is shown both fully and conservatively dressed. Her dress is simple, but as Shaw has pointed out, her white shawl and beribbon bonnet make it less the dress of a servant than an echo of the relatively modest dress worn by the Countess of Huntington, her patroness, in several of the Countess's portraits from the period. On the table, a book and quill provide signs of education and therefore gentility. We can't make out the title of the book, but one scholar has suggested that its binding is of a type known as a revivalist Bible binding and is thus most likely a Methodist Bible. And even though the depicted space is somewhat stark, Marcia Poynton has argued that the oval tabletop and curved style of the po poet's chair place Wheatley in a pictorial context of white female decorum. As Poynton points out with regard to John Singleton Copley's portrait of Francis Deering Wentworth, for, for a woman to be seated at a table, especially a small circular one, quote, is a sign of leisure, not of labor, end quote. Taken together, the attributes of Wheatley's portrait thus support a liberal assertion that with education and effort, the poet and other enslaved persons can transcend the object status assigned to them by the institution of chattel slavery. They confirm the humanity of this literate, neatly dressed, and well-postured individual, and therefore the injustice of her enslavement. In her groundbreaking study of this portrait, Shaw has also emphasized its influence. As she points out, portraits of British women writers made prior to 1773 tended to depict them simply as gentlewomen, um, as you see here. In contrast, Alexander Pope, one of Wheatley's chief influences, was sometimes depicted with his pen, and women artists like Angelica Kaufman sometimes painted themselves with the tools of their trade. Shaw argues that Wheatley's portrait, which circulated widely in the years after the book's publication, thus influenced the subsequent representation of women authors like Catherine McAuley, Hannah Moore, and Joanna Lee. For many reasons then, the fact of its existence, the remarkable nature of its representation, and its pictorial influence, Wheatley's portrait can and should be understood as a liberatory one. However, an emphasis on the portrait's liberatory potential does not address, does not address the full complexity of the frontispiece or of Wheatley's reception, which from her own time through ours has been deeply divided. In the, in the remaining part of this talk, I want to engage this complexity by examining an aspect of the portrait that has been, for the most part, overlooked. It's representation of Wheatley's racialized body and in particular of her dark skin. <clears throat> 
As the encircling description on the frame of the frontispiece denotes, Wheatley was not just a servant, but a quote unquote Negro servant. Attending to the way in which the engraving materializes race in her portrait is crucial because, as I will argue, it was not Wheatley's neat, neat dress, mod modest comportment, or evident literacy for which her detractors damned her. It was the color and qualities of her skin. This doubled representation of Wheatley as a person deserving of freedom on the one hand, and of Wheatley, of Wheatley as a person whose race precludes full subjective recognition on the other, provides a key to understanding her polarized reception. Before moving on, I want to touch on the popular attribution of this portrait to the enslaved artist Scipio Moorhead. As I mentioned earlier, Captain John Califf proposed, quote, that if you would get the portrait done, it can be engraved here, and, end quote, and he was writing from London. Um, Califf's wording suggests that Wheatley sat for her portrait in Boston and that the engraving was easily done from it rather than from a second sitting. Because of this, the design has often been attributed to, to Scipio Moorhead, an enslaved artist to whom Wheatley addresses a poem in her book. As Shaw notes, this attribution was first posited by James Porter in his foundational survey of African American art. Porter offered Moorhead's authorship as a conjecture, um, but despite the fact that no further evidence has come to light, many authors, many scholars um, have repeated this attribution as a fact. Setting aside the question of Moorhead's authorship, it is important to recall that the original portrait did not circulate among a wide audience. What we have, and what 18th century viewers had, is an engraved version made by an unidentified London printmaker, almost certainly a white man who did not meet Wheatley. And while the composition and iconography of the frontispiece may derive from the source image, its materiality and facture are products of engraving itself. Rather than looking past the print to an unknown original, it thus behooves us to look closely at the engraving itself for what it may say about its subject. In particular, I'd like to focus our attention on the way in which the engraved frontispiece represents Wheatley's skin. As we've seen, recent interpretations of this portrait have focused on the iconography and format of the poet's portrayal in order to show how the portrait relates to other 18th century portraits. In doing so, these readings have given us a fuller understanding of Wheatley's portrayal by showing how the frontispiece represents Wheatley as a gentlewoman, an author, and a Christian. And yet this means in turn that the representation of race has been set aside um, in recent interpretation, interpretations of the frontispiece. While the relegation of race has made space for a more comprehensive understanding of Wheatley's portrait, it is also problematic because race has always been an integral part of her reception. Take, for example, Thomas Jefferson's assessment of Wheatley in his notes on the state of Virginia. There, the statesman famously dismissed Wheatley's poems as being, quote, beneath the level of critique, end quote. Religion, Jefferson wrote, um, quote, indeed has produced a Phyllis Wheatley, but it could not produce a poet, end quote. Henry Louis Gates Jr. astutely points out that Jefferson's comments damningly changed the terms of critique, whereas Wheatley's supporters had envisioned her book and her portrait as proving the possibility of a Black author, Jefferson demands poetic quality in addition to the mere fact of authorship. That said, as some of you may know, Jefferson also did not balk at questioning mere fact. Um, rather than acknowledge Wheatley's authorship, he deprecatingly alluded to, quote, the poems produced under her name, end quote. Significantly, this dismissal occurs in the middle of a well-known passage in which Jefferson, almost in the same breath, denounced slavery and yet upheld racial inequality. Jefferson's tendentious compar comparison of black and white bodies is wide ranging, but his primary argument concerns the differential appearance and behavior of skin. Despite its troubling content, I'm going to quote this passage at length because Jefferson's language, which slips between political, scientific, and aesthetic discourses is important to my argument. So this is Jefferson. The first difference which strikes us is that of color. Whether the black of the Negro resides in the reticular membrane between the skin and scarf skin or in the scarf skin itself, whether it proceeds from the color of the blood, the color of the bile, or from that of some other secretion, 
The difference is fixed in nature and is as real as if its seat and cause were better known to us. And is this difference of no importance? Is it not the foundation of a greater or less share of beauty in the two races? Are not the fine mixtures of red and white, the expressions of every passion by greater or less suffusions of color in the one, preferable to that eternal monotony which reigns in the countenances, that immovable veil of black which covers all the emotions of the other race, end quote. In addressing this description, literary scholars like Jay Flegelman and Mark Ellen Matz have used Jefferson's characterization of black skin's inexpressiveness to propel us towards insights regarding his refusal to acknowledge the rational and imaginative capacity of black persons, and specifically that of Phyllis Wheatley. Um, I'm of course in agreement with these analyses, but here I'm interested in staying close to the specific images that Jefferson's passage evokes, um, which point to both larger cultural concerns and the specific appearance of Wheatley's portrait. Take for example, his striking phrase, quote, that immovable veil of black, end quote. Synthesizing Jefferson's anatomical reference to scarf skin, um, which was a period term for the outermost layer of the epidermis, and his aesthetic den denunciation of black skin's eternal monotony, the phrase plays on the charged relationship between sartorial choices and sociopolitical identity in the 18th century. Specifically, the anxiety expressed by the phrase illuminates the limits of a Republican political aesthetic founded on notions of transparency, openness, and the bared face as an index of interior feeling. Jefferson's phrase, that immovable veil of black, seems especially resonant when we examine the, one, the Wheatley frontispiece closely. The lines that render the poet's skin are regularly spaced and angled, such that the crosshatching resembles a woven cloth that has been gently stretched along its bias to follow the contours of her face, neck, and arms. This resemblance is heightened by the densely scattered dots that the engraver used to darken the value of Wheatley's skin. Because of their incongruence with the linear pattern, the dots seem, oh, excuse me, the dots seem overrun by the cross-hatched lines, adding to the impression that the cross-hatching constitutes a layer or a veil that intervenes between the viewer and the print's subject. To some extent, of course, in Wheatley's portrait, we are simply confronting engraving's conventional logic, its translation of form, texture, and other qualities into what William Ivins variously described as a, quote, linear web, end quote, or more polemically, a net of rationality. Engraving's capacity for monolithic representation was especially well suited to early modern author frontispieces, which frequently adopted the conceit of a classical bust in order to project its associations of permanence, nobility, and authority. In the 1667 frontispiece of the poet Catherine Phillips, the engraver Isaac Beckett used, utilized a cohesive schema of hatching across Phillips's face and dress, such that skin and textile appear to be carved out of a single material. Yet despite the widespread use of line engraving for portraits in the early modern period, engraving's artifice was sometimes a source of unease, especially when applied to smooth objects like skin. Already by 1662, the English virtuoso John Evelyn had acknowledged the artificiality of line engraving syntax. Fabric surfaces, Evelyn explained, are relatively easy to represent because the texture of quote, stuffs, cloth, linen, and other draperies, end quote, offered delineable markers of their relief for three-dimensional form. In other words, the visible weave of a textile provides a map of its folds and curves, which are easily replicated by engraving's linear syntax. In contrast, the internal curvatures of, quote, nudities and other smooth surfaces, which offer no such direction or clue, end quote, require a representational convention to make their topography legible. Notably, Evelyn explained engraving's convention with an illustration of a sculpted head, implicitly acknowledging that line engraving, for all of its representational prowess, is hard pressed to account for the almost imperceptible elements that give texture and depth to biological skin. The subtle changes in color and tone, the delicate hairs and fuzzy down, the minute and tenuous lines, 
With regards to early modern portraits like that of Catherine Phillips, such details were unimportant, even undesirable. But as I will explain shortly, the aesthetic paradigm would soon shift. The engraving of Wheatley's skin in her frontispiece is thus surprising in its close alignment with Evelyn's description written over a century prior to her book's publication. And her face and neck might easily have been substituted for the sculpted busts represented in Evelyn's iconism in Phillips's frontispiece, but only these bared portions of her body. Her clothing evidences instead the engraver's nimble and inventive hand. Note the fine lines that trace the ruffles and folds of her cap and the broken marks that skillfully evoke the reflective sheen of her dress fabric. In contrast, the lines that render Wheatley's dark skin traverse its surface in a relentlessly linear pattern. Furthermore, the quality of these lines, their linear integrity, the smoothness of their taper and swell, their measured curvature, all of these emphasize their gravenness or the unwavering continuous deep plow of the burin through the copper plate. They thus assert one of engraving's defining qualities that made it such a prized means of reproduction in the early modern period, its strength and permanence. Engraving's fracture also forms the basis of its veil-like quality. To make a line engraving, an engraver carves a series of furrows into the polished surface of a copper matrix. Ink is applied to the plate and then wiped off the surface such that ideally, all traces of ink are removed from the smooth surface of the matrix, while a maximum amount of ink is retained in the engraved lines. When the print is pulled, the paper is pressed against the matrix with great force, transferring not only the ink design, but also to some degree, the flatness of the matrix itself, as the paper is essentially ironed by the unmarked portions of the matrix. The integrity of the coppersmith's surface is consequently maintained and mirrored in the final print, with the ink lines creating a relief that protrudes ever so slightly above the white areas of the print. There is thus an engraving an intimate, even inextricable consonance between the relations of furrow to matrix, ink to paper, patched surface to represented body just as they execute a representational program in which our eyes are carried across the surfaces they describe, engravings inked lines travel uninterruptedly on top of the paper's surface, creating a literal material veil. When the engraver has done their work well, moreover, engravings hatched patterns can seem to constitute a shroud that is shaped by the represented forms of the print heaving and swirling beneath it, rather than being itself the form that conjures their illusionistic presence. Paradoxically, however, engraving's veil-like presence is often most pronounced in the parts of the engraving that feature the smoothest or least formally complicated forms, areas like Phillips's face and décolletage, as opposed to the tight ringlets of her hair or the soft drape of her garment. It is precisely in the most important areas of expression, therefore, that engraving's quote-unquote veil obtrudes most strongly on our visual experience of a portrait. And as Jefferson's association of monotonous skin and muted subjectivity makes clear, by the third quarter of the 18th century, engraving's immovable veil could be equally, if not, dis if not more decidedly, understood as a representational liability. The story of how engraving's immovable veil became a representational liability lies in the shift from a classical abstract understanding of corporeal skin to an enlightenment understanding of skin as a subtly differentiated, interfacial, and changeable surface. In the early modern period, skin was construed as a homogeneous casing for the body. For those who possessed a specialized interest in such matters, anatomists and natural philosophers, skin was conceptualized as a net or a fabric, a porous but essentially passive covering. This understanding underlies the stylization of skin as drapery in a crochet figures like the ones you see here. Simultaneously, and among a more general audience, the English's early modern encounters with other skin tones sponsored a dermal ideal of whiteness and sculptural homogeneity, as when the 17th century poet Edmund Waller heralded the, quote, yielding marble of a snowy breast, end quote. 
These idealizations were directly connected, as Angela Rosenthal has argued, to the construction of a racial hierarchy in which composed statuesque white figures are contrasted with dynamic and often infantilized white figures. With the advent of Baconian empiricism, and specifically the introduction of the microscope, the scientific conception and aesthetic valuation of skin were both transformed. In 1698, the English surgeon and anatomist William Cooper published detailed illustrations of skin's microscopic structures in his Anatomy of Humane Bodies. The accompanying text explains that, far from being a simple or homogeneous entity, human skin is a complexly structured organ made up of several layers, including the outermost cuticula or scarf skin, which term you may recall Jefferson used in his text. As these illustrations and the term scarf skin evidence, the thinness and newly visible texture of the skin's outer layer invited both visual and conceptual comparisons to fabric. At the same time, corporeal skin was revealed to be something more than the cuticula, involving not only the underlying cutis, but also many other elements, things like hairs, glands, and pores. Furthermore, this heterogeneous organ was revealed to be not passive, but active, mediating between the body and its surroundings, skin's temperature, texture, and color are constantly in flux. By the second half of the 18th century, authors and, and artists no longer privileged whiteness as an end in and of itself, but rather valorized what Jefferson described as, quote, the fine mixtures of red and white, whose greater or less suffusion make visible the expressions of every passion, end quote. Throughout the Anglo-American world, the blush of pale skin was taken as an incorruptible sign of internal feeling, and thus a key guarantor of a subject's sincerity. In this context, engraving Hatching's intimate relationship to fabric, to scarves, veils, and other draperies was problematic in that engraving's woven syntax literally overwrote skin's subtle surface qualities. And it's perhaps in response to this um, that in the second half of the 18th century, we see um, a kind of proliferation, a proliferating development of um, tonal techniques for print. Um, and you see an example of this here in the form of the mezzotint. In his 1768 essay on prints, the aesthetician William Gilpin argued for the superiority of the quote unquote soft mezzotint, um, this tonal printmaking technique in representing skin for unlike engraving, the tonal technique did not require, quote, the prejudices of cross lines, which exist on no natural bodies, end quote. Mesotin's fragility prevented them from becoming widely used for frontispiece prints, but Gilpin's words suggest that the proliferation of tonal techniques in the late 18th century and their special popularity for portraits was motivated by a desire to represent pale skin's smooth gradations of color and texture. In 1773, when Wheatley's portrait was made, engraving was already losing ground to tonal techniques like stipple engraving. Um, and so you can see that here in this um, chart where the kind of solid squares are examples of line engraving. Um, Wheatley's is here in 1773, but you can see that already by that time, um, there was a breakdown um, towards the use, um, a greater use of etching um, and other and, and tonal techniques. And even among line engravings, um, the bared skin of the face and neck had long been sites of exceptional treatment. By the late 17th century, British engravers generally made an effort to emphasize not only the lightness of their subject's skin, but also its expressive variability. In this portrait of Afra Ben, the engraver rendered the majority of her face in small dashes and dots, interjecting hatching and cross hatching only in local areas. In other cases, as in a 1739 portrait of Elizabeth Rowe by George Virtue, the pattern is even more finely dissolved into a field of delicate, almost invisible marks. In contrast, the portrait of Wheatley um, exaggerates engraving's linearly coherent qualities to represent black skin as a homogeneous, unchanging surface. And in this slide, I've paired Wheatley's, um, the portrait, Wheatley's portrait with a 1777 copy of the virtue engraving, which is much more roughly done, and but which nevertheless retains the broken line rendering the of the face, which 
um, I see as underscoring the fact that these representational strategies were understood to be an important aspect of the image. Thus far, I have compared the print portrait of Wheatley, a black woman, with print portraits of white women. But even comparisons with other print portraits of black subjects underscore the exceptional nature of her engraved representation. In contrast to the forcefully carved regular lines that delineate Wheatley's skin, this earlier portrait of the Muslim cleric Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, also known as Yob bin Suleiman, uses the freedom and delicacy of the chemically etched line to depict not only the detailed form of his face, but also the play of light across its surface. Some 50 years later, the frontispieces of Wheatley's contemporaries, the authors Ignatius Sancho and Olauda Equiano, were made like most frontispiece portraits in the period, using the softer textures of stipple engraving. The use of stipple engraving not only renders their skin with a texture that suggests its porosity and variability, but also by simple technical equation with the stipple portraits of white authors implies a basic similarity between black and white bodies, a difference of degree rather than kind. In both portraits of these black male authors, moreover, the engravers applied a linear pattern to their stippled coats. This addition, which was common in both stipple and mezzotint engravings of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, serves not only to darken their outer garments, but reiterates the harmonious correspondence between woven textiles and engravings linear syntax noted by Evelyn. Set in juxtaposition with this compounded mark, the merely stippled representations of Sancho's and Equiano's faces read as surfaces laid bare to the viewer, open books, so to speak like the Bible held out by Equiano for our perusal. In contrast to the portraits of these other black subjects, the engraved representation of Wheatley's face holds uncompromisingly to its regular pattern. A minimal modeling is achieved by broadening the lines around the curve of her chin and the back of her neck, but there is little indication that the form of her face emerges in relation to an internal or external light. Just as Wheatley's profile view refuses the possibility of a familiar connection between subject and viewer, the rendering of her skin draws an impassable barrier between the poet's thoughts and their outward expressions. The engraved portrait of Wheatley has often been characterized as the victim of, of technical naivete or poor workmanship a characterization that is fueled, I would argue, by viewers' subtle discomfort with the politics of the image. Yet this, yet this apologetic interpretation is undercut, as I mentioned earlier, by the skill that the unidentified engraver brought to certain parts of the image. Um, his simple but effective representation of the, sh of the um, sheen of Wheatley's sleeve, for example, and the subtle modeling of her kerchief and apron. By choosing to render Wheatley's skin in an uncompromising manner, the engraver made a portrait that invited viewers to reject the evidence of her authored words. Presented with the veil-like surface of Wheatley's engraved skin, white viewers like Jefferson were confirmed and encouraged in their belief that Black persons were biologically different from and inferior to white persons. In this regard, Wheatley's engraved portrait enacts a, found a foundational dynamic by which anti-slavery imagery often simultaneously acknowledges and denies the humanity of its subjects. However, it is also worth considering the possibility that the very obscuration of Wheatley's subjectivity served to safeguard it. Throughout this talk, I've interpreted the Wheatley frontispiece as a product of 18th century white British culture, which sought to deprecate the quote unquote, immovable veil of black skin. In the 21st century, however, we can confront this discursive and aesthetic inheritance. We can experience the portrait differently, not only because we have learned and are still valuing to va learning to value its subject and the subtlety of her writing, but also because we have been taught by writers like Edouard Glisson to recognize the right to and power of opacity. Glisson, as well as more recent theorists of the surface, Remind us that demanding transparency or mining the inner truth of a thing, person, or idea exerts its own kind of violence, and they invite us to adopt a different model of relationality, one that accepts and even revels in what can be experienced at the surface. In making this proposal, I want to be clear that I'm not minimizing the racist implications of the frontispiece's engraved surface, which 
as I've argued, um, have significantly impacted Wheatley's reception and further point to larger structural problems in Western art's portrayal of Black subjects. Yet I also affirm, as I hope many of you might, that works can exceed the time and place and also the politics of their making. In contrast to her Black and white authorial counterparts, Wheatley makes no overture to the viewer. Her gaze is directed inward, her written lines indecipherable. And yet the notion that these compositional choices make Wheatley more passive, more available to our piercing gaze, is repudiated by the systematic cross-hatching of her skin, whose dense, regular lines form a kind of armor, a delicate yet impenetrable chainmail. Unlike the punctuating marks left by a stipple roulette or a mezzotint rocker, the raised lines of the engraving sit lightly on the surface of the page. The asymmetrical cross-hatching with one set of parallel, parallel lines more pronounced than the other encourages us to move along, to follow its gentle curves without lingering over long in any one part of the image, to enjoy, in other words, what is offered to us at the surface. As with her dress, which covers her from neck to toe, the cross-hatching that delineates Wheatley's skin confounds our attempts to fathom this woman, to unpack her thoughts, feelings, and experiences for our aesthetic and analytical satisfaction. I want to close with a recent work by the contemporary artist Carrie James Marshall, which offers additional nuance to the way in which we might understand the hat surface of Wheatley's skin. This pen and ink drawing was made by Marshall in 2022 and first exhibited earlier this year. The drawing renders Wheatley as an older woman, gaze forward, um, working on the preface to her second book. Marshall chose to keep the encircling description, inscription, but the text now documents her married name, Phyllis Wheatley Peters, and identifies her as an African poet in America. Like others of Marshall's works, Phyllis Wheatley Peters, African poet in America, is motivated by the dearth of depictions that we have of pivotal Black figures and the failure of the historical record to provide a rich, full sense of this woman as an individual who lived in time. Because there are no other known portraits of Wheatley besides the frontispiece, Marshall chose as his model the director, actor, and playwright Cheryl Lynn Bruce, who is married to Marshall, and who was at the time herself researching Wheatley for a play she was directing. There's much that we could say about this stunning work. But I want, what I want to focus um, on here is Marshall's choice to render Wheatley's skin with densely spaced lines. As he related to conservator Heather, Heather Becker, this process demanded an intense level of focus such that Marshall could only work on the drawing a few hours a day. Responding to Becker's observation that it seems to have been a meditative process, Marshall said, quote, yes, meditative is the perfect term for the slow process required with this piece. Building the tones and depth using the repetition of lines was exacting. There's an important continuity to maintain from one mark to the next, placing dots between dots and lines between lines, end quote. I like to think that one of the things Marshall was meditating on as he rendered the surfaces of this piece, dot by dot and line by line, is the knowability and unknowability of Phy Phyllis Wheatley and the space of possibility that lies between them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was great. Um, I know that a few questions um, have started to come in. Let me see. But I was going to indulge myself <laughs> and ask you um, the first question to so give some time for others um, to uh, continue to ask um, questions as well. Um, I was thinking, you know, when I read your your piece and and, and during your talk, uh, and you po uh, pointed out um, Jefferson's quote, and that in the part of his quote is in the in the title um, of your um, of your article. And I was just curious as to how you made the, um, you know, kind of which came um, first. Was it your um, working with the Phyllis Wheatley portrait, and that made you think of the Jefferson quote, or the Jefferson quote made you think, I want you to, to do more, um, you know, close looking of the, the Wheatley portrait, sort of like, you know, I guess it's sort of like chicken and egg question, you know, kind of which came first in your your analytical um, process and, and, and those analytical connections. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do, I do think of it very much as a, a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Um, but I suppose, in terms of, um, the historical timeline, I was 
And this project actually grew out of a book chapter that I'm writing on mezzotint engraving. And in that, um, I, I sort of began with this, what seemed to me a kind of, um, the kind of incredible volume of um, mezzotint portraits that are made of elite white women in the second half of the 18th century and wondering um, about what might be motivating that besides pure economics, which is how um, they're sometimes discussed. And, um, and, and in, that, in the course of that, I began to think a lot about race and gender. And um, that brought me to the Jefferson quote. And then I notice, um, hmm, isn't it funny that in this same, I mean, it's a very long paragraph, but it's the same paragraph. He's also talking about Phyllis Wheatley and her portrait is um, so stunningly, it seems to be such a stunning fit with this image of black skin that he's constructing in that passage. Um, and so I suppose things sort of develop from there. Thank you. Oh, no, no, thank you. And and I must admit, and just you know, looking at the the portrait again, I know we have um, the uh, you know with with Zoom, and uh, you can um, magnify and you know just in, in digital purpose uh, for digital purposes. I mean, I really appreciated you were talking about with like the cross hatching and how sort of taking over for the the dots for the engraving. And I must I sort of got to a point that it almost you know, beyond, um, you know, thinking of skin and, and beyond scarf skin and, and, and veil, like almost looking like scales, like, which I had never yeah. kind of, sort of, you know, picked up in, in the yeah. portrait before. So I, yeah, I just, yeah, <laughs> appreciating your close looking to make me um, close look in, in that way as well. But we have some questions that, um, so let me um, start um, uh, question uh, peppering you with questions. Um, first one, um, are there any other portrayals of Wheatley besides the engraving in the book of two poems? Is there any critique about Wheatley's poems by contemporary female authors, um, writers? And this is sort of um, a, a corollary. I understand that John Wheatley and his wife supported her poems to be published and, pr uh, and printed. Why would any printer do this? Was it simply due to money, not notoriety, um, uniqueness, uniqueness, et cetera? I think, okay, um, hold on. That's three questions, so I'll try to, I, so I, don't, I don't forget any part of them. Um, sorry, the first part was, are there any other portrayals of Wheatley? Yes. Okay. Um, so, okay, to take the, to go backwards, I suppose. Um, yes, John Wheatley Peters did support um, Wheatley in the project of looking, um, seeking to publish a second volume of her poetry. One thing that scholars have talked about is um, how, much Wheatley struggled to find um, demand and um, interest in this project once she was uh, manumitted. So once she had kind of removed herself from this circle of white and especially female supporters as a kind of, I would say, in enslaved and therefore um, marginalized subject, she found it very difficult um, to garner the kind of interest that would allow her to publish the second book. But um, Vincent Carrada has talked, I think, very compellingly about the fact that in the late 18th century, there was a hunger and interest among the reading public for works by, um, let's say, unexpected authors. So um, authors that were seen to be um, outside the conventional expectations of um, the white literary male or female writer. And that, um, at least in the advert in the kind of proposals for Wheatley's first book, um, this seems to have been something that they were um, playing up in order to in order to garner demand. Um, about regarding contemporary critiques of the book by white uh, by female authors in particular, I'm not. None are coming to mind. Um, that's it's a really interesting question. Um, and I also wonder if perhaps there might be what we might call like informal critiques, like people writing about it in letters um, and or in diaries, um, but I'm not familiar with any off the top of my head. Um, in terms of other portrayals of Wheatley, there are other portrayals. Um, there are some, um, there's a woodcut that is somewhat well known and there was also a second version of the engraving that was made after her death. That's a lithograph version. Um, I would refer you to Megan Walsh's work if you're to whoever asked this question, um, because she has a really wonderful book chapter that talks about um, 
the kind of the range of representations of Wheatley, which we might not necessarily call portraits in the same way that the frontispiece is, but which nevertheless speak to how she was um, perceived both in her lifetime and shortly afterwards. Thank you. We'll get to the other questions here. Um, I love that Marshall uh, revisited the portrait. However, I like how the original engraver showed the texture of Wheatley's hair. Jennifer, did you examine how black hair was, is depicted in portraiture? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I have to admit that I haven't, I mean, I've thought a lot about the way in which um, Wheatley's hair is portrayed in the frontispiece because it's actually quite strange. It looks like it's um, it's a very like broad and dark mark, um, but it doesn't really look like a Buren line. So I've been in conversation with um, curators and conservators at the National Portrait Gallery about that because um, we're all a little bit mystified and curious about how that, that portion of the portrait was made. Um, but it's a great suggestion to sort of to look more um, broadly at the representation of hair. And of course, like one of the limiting factors is that we just don't have um, so many images, but I think it would still be a really worthwhile thing to examine more closely. Thank you. Another question. What a great talk. Thank you. Can you comment more on the use, function, meaning of the profile in the 18th century, as opposed to the front facing portraits of the period, and then in the contemporary Marshall portrait? Yeah, okay. So first, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing shout outs to other scholars, because there, you know, so many people have done such great work on Wheatley, and especially recently. Um, but Rachel Walker is um, the person that I would look to for more information, um, a really um, thoughtful critique of the profile view and how this perhaps placed Wheatley um, in a genre of physiognomic portraiture, right? Um, so sort of um, subtly position, or maybe not so subtly positioning her as a kind of um, an object of study um, that was tied to racist ideas in the period. Yeah. It also, I can't help but I mean, not that there's anything new, but like also like profile, like silhouettes and you know, that the period of time yeah. and you know, yeah. Um, thank you. Let's see, next question. Um, Dr. Chong, how, help us understand more how black skin was thought of differently or not after the invention of the microscope. Was this reflected in portraits as well as engravings? And I know you talked about this in your article as well. Yeah, so I think that, um, as with many things, it's a complex history. Um, so the microscope, I think, fueled um, an existing interest in understanding the the kind of the, the anatomy of white and black skin and what kinds of differences there were, what kinds of differences um, exist and how significant these differences are. So on the one hand, some microscopic studies suggested that um, black skin was actually very, really only very superficially different from white skin in the sense that um, some anatomists identified the, the kind of pigment layer as just being a very thin coating um, underneath um, the outermost cuticula or scarf skin. Um, but I think that in some ways that fueled um, the discursive desire to um, to, to make stronger the difference between black and white skin. So to say that even, so that even though it seemed anatomically to be a relatively, um, a difference of degree rather than kind, right? Like the, um, all skin is colored to some extent, but just colored with different um, densities of pigments. Um, figures like Jefferson are really trying to draw a bifurcation there between white and black skin and to say, um, this is really something fundamentally different and undesirable. Thank you. A few more questions for you. And I think we should have time just so far. It's about 157. Hopefully folks can stay a few minutes after um, um, two o'clock. Um, I, I think these are really great questions and I'd like to hear Jennifer's answers. Um, thank you for this research. Uh, looking forward to reading the article. In this talk, you discuss the material processes of representing black skin and different types of metal, plate, intaglio engraving, and the affordances of copper plate versus etching. I wonder if you can say anything about relief engraving, wood cutting, much of which obscures any features of black faces and fills 
fills them in entirely with ink. Is there a reason for an intaglio process in the production of Wheatley's book as opposed to relief? I mean, I think that the question asker has kind of answered um, their question to some extent, which is that in um, intaglio in general allows for a greater nuance and fineness of line. Um, and I do think that's in line with um, with one of the ambitions of the frontispiece. And I really, I kind of, I want to go back to that at this point and to say, you know, this, this was um, a project that was meant to assert um, the kind of the genius of Wheatley and the kind of the remarkable um, fact of her um, ability to write poetry, to be an artist. Um, and it, so I think um, the like the kind of representational capacities of line engraving are important here. And there's also, I think, just a, um, a kind of commercial consideration as well, which is that line engraving is more expensive than woodcut and so also carries a certain cachet that, um, that would not have been associated with a woodcut relief. Thank you. Um, quick, quick, next question. Does the lack of light on Wheatley's portrait follow a trend of rendering black subjects with less contrast and value compared to white figures? I've noticed in a lot of paintings, the faces of, of the black figures appear flat compared to white figures. Oh, it's interesting that you say that. Um, I, I do think that um, the question of how light is um, and kind of the play of light across the surface of the face is rendered is really important. Um, one one thing I've noticed looking at early mo more modern portraits of white female authors is that they also often seem flat to me because there's such a desire to make them as pale as possible. Um, and of course, in line engraving, um, you have this, or in most intaglio techniques, you have a complication in the sense that um, in order to show modeling, you have to add darkness to the image. Um, so, um, so those, to borrow like a term from photography, like those um, portraits of white female authors often look kind of overexposed <laughs> um, in the sense of trying to make them very, very pale and therefore like using very little line. Thank you. Excellent information, metic meticulously presented. Do you think that if more schools offered courses in engraving or other old world art techniques that this would help discipline young young, men, young minds? And just so folks know, it's about two. I have um, one more question in the queue and I think I'll have to um, cut it off um, after that. But thank you everyone for your questions and thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's such an interesting question. I mean, engraving is a very taxing um, and slow art. Um, so I guess I think about it maybe um, less in terms of the possibility of disciplining minds, but that um, education in art making is a way of helping us look and understand the slowness, complexity, and labor that goes into making images and making works of art. Um, I know that for me, um, part of um, how I came to this work is um, that as an architecture undergrad, I took um, a semester of intaglio printmaking. Um, and I just, you know, in my mind, like printmaking, the kind, the kind of slowness of it, the repetitive, like um, the repetitive nature of the, the kind of different steps of the process and that kind of always that surprise moment of seeing what comes out of the press, despite everything seeming to be like relatively controlled. Um, are really have really informed um, my analyses of prints, historical prints. It also also makes me think with printmaking also the importance of you know just inking the plate and then like you could things can go horribly awry. Um, that I'm just sort of thinking is um, I've done work with um, lithography and there was a lithographer uh, a P.S. Duval who was talking about you know inking a, a stone was like a violinist with it's his but you know oh, had to be like it's kind of you know careful in that way. So it's, sorry for that little that. aside, but making me think of that. Um, last question again. Thank you everyone. Um, thank you for this intriguing talk. I'm in, I'm curious about whether you explored what West African imagery to see if there might be connections, especially if the illustration might have been made by an enslaved African who was trained by a European? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, and I did, in research, like one always has to kind of make certain decisions about what to focus on. And I think at least in the project as it's developed so far, I've really been focusing on the engraving and trying to think about the engraving as 
its own object that we might want to study. Um, so to think about what is the engrave, what is the engraving bringing to this image, to the source image. Um, but I think that um, if I were to continue this research into the Wheatley portrait, I would definitely want to think more about the sort, the possibilities of the source image, and um, and perhaps to revisit this um, question of the Scipio Moorhead attribution. I just want to again thank everyone for attending this afternoon and Jennifer that was, as others said brilliant mm -hmm. talk I so appreciated you that you took the time um, to have this conversation um, with us um, it's a little after um, of two so um, as I said we're going to start heading out but Jennifer do you have any um, last remarks that you'd like to make no I just want to thank you Erica for the invitation and just thank you everyone for coming and for your questions which have really been fantastic and um, yeah, make me excited to kind of take this project um, in a new direct in new directions. Great. And just one more shout out. If anyone in the um, audience would like to apply for a visual culture program fellowship, please, please do. And again, everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.